Welcome to the third lesson in the American History Overview series. So in our first two lessons, we've looked at who was here in the present day U.S. first. We've looked at the arrival of the first Europeans, who the Europeans were that settled areas first. And now we're going to start looking closer at individual colonies. So today we are looking at the tobacco colonies. And very soon you'll know why we call them that. So first, we must talk about Virginia. Isn't it absolutely stunningly beautiful? The way Virginia was settled was by companies. So back during this colonial period, governments could start colonies, but there were also these huge companies that had almost as much power as governments. And they had the ability and authority to go out and start colonies as well. So, in the case of Virginia, King James I of England gave charters to two branches of the same company. So the Virginia company was one great big company. There were two competing branches within that company. They each got their own charter. So the Plymouth Company was given a charter that allowed them to place one colony between the 38th and 45th parallels. Then the London Company was allowed one colony between the 34th and 41st parallels. Now, they're going to be able to expand later, but this is what their initial charter allows them, is one colony. They have their set zone that they're allowed to be in. But if you're looking at the map, you probably notice a little problem. So the London Company's territory is in blue. The Plymouth Company's territory is in yellow. But what's going on with the green? Well, the, the two charters actually overlapped. So there was an additional rule. You must have 100 miles between your two colonies. So they can settle in that overlapping zone, but they have to make sure that their two colonies are 100 miles apart. In 1606, both companies prepare their expeditions. They're both going to establish their first colonies, but only one's going to succeed. Now, something very important to know, because this is going to become important in the future, hint, think 1776, I need to say something about the rights of Englishmen with regard to colonies. So the charter of the Virginia Company guaranteed that its colonists held the exact same rights as Englishmen. So in other words, you living in the Americas have the same rights as citizens that you enjoyed back in England. Future colonist documents included this same provision, anybody who came over as part of the Virginia Company. So that would, the Plymouth Company, the London Company, those are both under this giant Virginia Company. So because of this, colonists reasonably believed that even in the Americas, they had the same rights of Englishmen. Not everybody came over through the Virginia Company, though. Keep that in mind, too. But this is kind of planting the seed, this idea that we have the same rights. And generally, that's going to be the practice initially. So England plants Jamestown. In late 1606, the Virginia Company sends out three ships. Specifically, this is the London Company branch sending out ships. Spring 1607, they finally land at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. When they land, they are promptly attacked by Indians, so they move on. Then, May 24, 1607, about 100 colonists, 105, all men, land along the banks of the James River. Now, they pick this because it's an easily defensible location, but it's got the slight problem that it is absolutely swarming with mosquitoes who carry diseases, and that's going to be problematic for these people. This is roughly what it would have looked like where they settled. So what should we name our colony? It's got to be a name King James would like. How about Jamestown? Perfect. How about the river? What name do we give it? Better go with the name the king would find pleasing. How about the James River? Perfect. Perfect. 
And what should we name our fort that will defend our colony? Well, I reckon we'd best stick with a name the king likes. Let's see. How about James Fort? Excellent. Honestly, Carl, I don't know how you do it. You got a rare gift for naming things. They just come to me. Uh, obviously, it didn't quite go down that way. Uh, I don't know if there was a Carl involved, but they did basically name everything after King James because they wanted to keep him happy and, you know, be allowed to keep doing what they're doing. So if you look on this map, you can see where the lost colony of Roanoke that we talked about before was situated. This time, they've gone further up for Jamestown. And part of the reason is because you remember that the English left on rather bad terms. They ticked off a lot of Native Americans. This is a map that they drew of their new colony, showing James Fort at Jamestown. And yes, there's an E at the end. Spelling was all over the place at this time in history. Um, a lot of people weren't literate, and a lot of people that were couldn't agree on how words should be spelled. So basically, there wasn't formalized spelling. You just kind of spelled things any which way. And here on this map, you can see what the fort at Jamestown would have looked like. So you had the palisade or the outer wall protecting it. Um, the bulwarks, which are defensible points where you would station men and weapons. There's a burial ground at Jamestown, um, which will become very important and very populated. There's actually archaeological digs that have been digging up the burial ground at Jamestown, and there's been quite a bit learned from the bodies in the graveyard, incidentally. And you can see they had housing for the governor. They had housing for important people. The storehouse. The storehouse is really important because that's where all the food is kept. There's the church, barracks. So that is James Fort. Well... Initially, Jamestown was not a successful colony at all. Jamestown was, in fact, a nightmare. You, you did not want to be on that first group of people coming to Jamestown. No siree. <laughs> From 1606 to 1607, 40 people died on the voyage. Not exactly a, a great trip over. Then, 1609, another ship from England that was en route to Jamestown lost its leaders and its supplies in a shipwreck off Bermuda. So, I mean, they were having all kinds of trouble resupplying, too. And the people who made it to Jamestown had a very high mortality rate. Settlers died by the dozens. There were reasons for this. Now, one issue was those mosquitoes spreading disease. A lot of people died of disease. But... Same issue with Roanoke. They did not pack the things that they would actually need to do what they were setting out to do. They were really dumb about the things that they brought. They did not bring sufficient farming equipment, even though they're going to have to farm for their food. And part of the reason is because the people who are settling Jamestown are gentlemen. They're wealthy English people. So these gentlemen have never had to do manual labor, and they do not want to do manual labor now that they're in a colony. But they expect to eat. So, you know, there's a, a big disconnect here. No work, but yet wants to eat. And then the settlers are so obsessed with gold that they're spending their time searching for gold instead of hunting or farming. So they've basically completely ignored the most basic of human needs. It's really not surprising that they had a high mortality rate. Now, you may be wondering, how do we know for sure all this information? That's a valid question. In the case of Jamestown, there was a lot of documentation. There are some things where we have to make inferences because we don't always have complete information. There's also archaeological digs that have taken place at Jamestown pretty extensively. This picture shows one of them where they were digging up some bodies that actually turned out to be original settlers. And so from the bodies, the bones, they can actually find out a lot. You can figure out how somebody died. You can tell from the bones whether they suffered from malnutrition. You can get a, a rough idea sometimes of what the diet was. Oh, enter... Captain John Smith. And no, this did not go down anything like the Disney movie Pocahontas. Disney movie Pocahontas has some really pretty music and it's a fun movie, but it is completely 
historically inaccurate. Basically, every single thing in the movie is wrong. But Captain John Smith really did live. He is credited with saving Jamestown by forcing people to work in order to eat. So he became the colony's president from the summer of 1608 to the fall of 1609. Previously, when Jamestown initially started, the idea was that they were going to use a common store system. So one storehouse, everybody supplies the storehouse, and then we share the food from the storehouse evenly among us. The problem was, as we saw, people were not willing to work. So John Smith institutes a very strict policy that you must work if you want food. If you don't work, you don't eat. Regardless of rank or occupation, even the wealthy, wealthy gentleman must work for the common good or you suffer the wrath of John Smith. And it's not just that he won't let you eat. You might also get whipped or suffer other punishments. Now, other things that John Smith did, he dealt very harshly with the Native Americans. So not the nice guy who falls in love with Pocahontas like in the movie. And by the way, Pocahontas, she really existed, but she was a little kid. He was not interested in her romantically. So John Smith deals very harshly with the natives. He uses threats and force to get corn, which does provide for the colony, but it severely annoys the Virginia company because they do not want to get off on bad terms with the natives yet again. Chief Powhatan also is irritated by this, reasonably. So finally, in October of 1609, under pressure from his enemies at Jamestown, he'd also been wounded by a gunpowder explosion, plus the Indians weren't super happy with him, the Virginia company's not super happy, he returns to England. So the the man is incredibly famous, but if you actually think about it, he was only here a very brief period of time. He did help save Jamestown. Some of the fame is deserved, but actually his bigger contribution, the true value of John Smith, was after he got back to England. He became the single biggest promoter in England of North American colonization. He wrote multiple books and articles talking about his time. Now, one thing about John Smith, the man was a liar. (laughs) There's just no polite way to say it. He really liked to tell tall tales. So as historical documents, his writings have to be taken with a grain of salt. He really liked to never let the truth get in the way of a good story. He always liked to be the hero of his stories. And he'd had some very exciting escapades in his life as this adventurer and sailor and all, but he also told some really, really whoppers of lies. But it worked. His accounts of life over here made people want to come. So eventually a new charter was granted and the Virginia company had their land expanded. So Virginia as of 1619 was defined as this area in red all the way to the next sea, from sea to sea. Now, mind you, the English have not made it from sea to sea. They've basically just gone a little bit inland from the coast, but you can see how huge Virginia initially was. Now in the teal, you can see New England, the charter that'll be given to the Plymouth Consul. That's gonna include the Pilgrims. We'll talk about them in the next lesson. And you can see their charter is also quite large, sea to sea, Um, Their land grant includes land that belongs to France, which will prove exciting in the future. And then they also have a conflict because Virginia and New England overlap. Similar issue that they had with those initial charters. I have no idea why they gave overlapping charters. This is what some of the dwellings at Jamestown would have looked like. These are reconstructions. We have some basic information and we know how house design at the time worked. So these are probably pretty accurate. So here's a house and then you can also see the church. So what I wanna do next, we're gonna do a little activity. We're gonna look at some statistics about life in Jamestown and Virginia as a whole, because Jamestown is not it. They're gonna put all sorts of further settlements. But let's look at some statistics 
and try to make some inferences or some educated guesses about what life would have been like. So here's our first statistic. Total people settled in Jamestown in 1607, 105. Population of Jamestown after the first winter, 38. Look at those two numbers. 105 people are the total population in 1607. After the first winter, the total population is now 38. I'll bet that you're making some inferences, but let's continue. Total settlers sent to Jamestown from 1607 to 1624, 6,000. Population of Jamestown in 1625, 1,200, as in 1,200. All right, and one final statistic. Percentage of Jamestown children who lived past the age of five, 20%, meaning 80% die before the age of five. So what inferences can we make based on this information? Let's go back and we'll pull up the information again and let's see if you can make some inferences. Again, making an inference is when you take information that you have and you draw a logical conclusion or a educated guess, but it's a little bit stronger than just a guess. All right, so here's our information again. Let's just look at the first two statistics to start with. So the total people settled in Jamestown, 1607, 105. The population after the first winter, 38. So between May of 1607 and early 1608, we've gone from 105 people to 38 people. Draw an inference from that. Uh, one inference you could draw from that is, wow, a lot of people died, right? Now, why do you think they died? Maybe the conditions are very extreme. Maybe they're not prepared for the winter. You could infer that probably because we know that they didn't bring proper supplies, maybe there's mass starvation. And you, by the way, would be correct if you're drawing those inferences. So total settlers sent to Jamestown from 1607 to 1624, so over a 17 year period, 6,000 further people come here, in addition to the 105 that had actually reached the shore. Population of Jamestown in 1625, 1,200. So what inference can we draw from that? probably you're getting a picture in your mind of a very inhospitable place, a very hard life. Probably they're not becoming quickly successful at growing sufficient food to feed themselves. And maybe you're thinking back to that mention of mosquitoes and disease. Disease is killing off a lot of them. And maybe you're thinking back to that information about getting off on the bad terms with some of the Native Americans. So maybe some of the death is coming from there. Those would all be good inferences to draw. Take information that you know and try to reach a logical conclusion from it. And let's not ignore this final statistic. The percentage of Jamestown children who live past the age of five is only 20%, which means 80% of all new children born into the colony will die before the age of five. So what does that tell you? Well, you could infer from there that you know, the nutritional issues, the disease issues, all the different risks of life. They don't have proper medical care. It's not like they moved to a new land that had hospitals. And also, frankly, medical science was very, very lacking at this time in history. All right, let's do some more inferences. Average life expectancy in Virginia in the 1600s, this is not just Jamestown, this is any colony in Virginia, 48 years. Average life expectancy in England in the 1600s, 54 years. Average life expectancy in New England, so that would be further up the coast, the area where like Massachusetts is today, 70 years. So what inferences can we make based on this information? 
So looking at it again, average life expectancy anywhere in Virginia in the 1600s, 48 years. So that's how long a person's total life is on average. Back in England at the same time, you could expect to live to be 54. Um, this is assuming that you're like moderately wealthy. Poor people had a much, much shorter lifespan. And the average life expectancy in New England, so further up the coast in what is now the United States, same time period, 70 years. What do you infer? Clearly, something is better about New England, right? Somehow that colony has features of it that are less deadly than Virginia. So maybe the people are going there more prepared or maybe they're working better. Maybe there's less disease. Maybe they don't have hostile Native Americans. Now I'm not going to tell you what the actual truth is because we're going to see that in the next lesson. But you can see that life in Virginia is very hard, very difficult. You have a high expectation of dying young. It's definitely a lot harder than it would be if you'd stayed back in England. Let's do one more set of statistics. The estimated African slaves in Virginia in 1619, which is when the first shipload arrived, was 20. The estimated African slaves in Virginia in 1649, so 30 years later, 3,004. Uh, the reason, by the way, it says estimated, we have records, but because slaves are considered property rather than people, there's always the chance that one person could go unrecorded or that there could be certain errors. And, you know, you don't know exactly when people died. They didn't always keep those records. Estimated African slaves in Virginia by 1,700, 13,000. Estimated African slaves in Virginia in 1720, 27,000. So let's consider those four numbers. So the estimated slaves at the very beginning, 1619, this would be roughly 12 years after the establishment of Jamestown Colony, they bring the first 20 slaves. 30 years later, there are now 3,004 slaves. At the end of the century, there's now 13,000 slaves. In just 20 years, we go from 13,000 slaves to 27,000. What inferences are you drawing from looking at these numbers? When I look at them, an inference that I'm drawing is that there must be a reason why they're feeling the need to import so many slaves. So. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking the colony must be thriving by this point and they're building some kind of money-making industry. Maybe it's, it's digging something up or it's growing something or it's making something. There's some kind of industry that makes a lot of money that's probably going, and that money is probably going back to England and they need labor for this. And in order to make a big profit, they want cheap labor or free labor. So I look at these two numbers here at the end where you have the population of slaves more than double in a 20-year period, and I'm inferring that whatever they're using these slaves for is growing in importance. Maybe there's a really important cash crop that's being harvested, and they want to use slave labor for that so that they don't have to pay you know, day laborers to be out there harvesting it. Hmm. Here's two more numbers for you. The ratio of white servants to African slaves in the 1670s, four to one. So for every four white servants, there was one African slave. You could also say there are four times as many white servants as there are African slaves in the 1670s. 20 years later, ratio of African slaves to white servants, 1690s, four to one. So look carefully at those two. Uh, that's not the exact same statistic. There's, there's been a big shift, right? 
first, there were four white servants for every African slave. In other words, four times as many white servants as there were African slaves. Now, 20 years later, there are four times as many African slaves as there are white servants. And that seems to fit with those numbers that we looked at above. So, what inferences can we make based on all that information? Think about the economy of Virginia as it's growing, because it's growing a lot. This is beyond just Jamestown, remember. This is all of Virginia. Lots of settlements now. They have cities. So what do those numbers about slaves tell you? Well, one inference you might make is that slavery is increasingly important to this colony and is rapidly replacing paid labor. That this idea of purchasing a human and basically using them as farm equipment has really taken off and that the economy is becoming increasingly dependent on that slave labor. All right. Thank you for participating in a bit of inference. Let's move on. The way Virginia gets settled is through a river settlement pattern. So large plantations would be established, greater than 100 acres, and they were widely spread apart, greater than five miles apart. And they would establish them along the James River and along other rivers that came off the James River. So they're sticking to being close to rivers because that would be easy transportation, source of water, etc. But Instead of settling in villages primarily, what's happening in Virginia is a wealthy family comes over with their servants and possibly with their slaves or they buy slaves when they get here. They would also have some further laborers and they might have multiple generations of their family living together and they will establish one large, huge plantation and it's five miles or more away from their nearest neighbor. Can you infer any possible social or economic problems if this is the way that you're doing settlements? Think about how you could do a settlement. You could have a group of people come up together, settle into a village close together, work together to establish businesses. What does this river settlement have as possible challenges? Well, for starters, if you're this far away from your neighbors, it's going to be a little bit challenging if you need to, say, form a militia to defend your colony, right? Because you might not know your neighbors very well. And if you need to gather people together to build some kind of common government, it's quite a bit of distance you'd have to travel to go from house to house people would be rather independent, don't you think? If they live further away from one another, you would depend on one another less, depend on yourself and your own resources more. Think about how that might impact the development of a society if people are starting out very self-focused and independent rather than focused on the group. All right, let's look at another aspect of life in Virginia. Widowarchy. Fun little made-up word. <clears throat> what do you think that might mean? Something to do with uh, a lot of women being widows, right? So here's the problem. There was high mortality among the men, the husbands and the fathers, within Virginia. Which means many women in the Chesapeake area had unusually high autonomy and wealth. Autonomy means independence. Unlike women in most societies at this time in history who are very subservient to their husbands, these women have lost their husbands, have inherited their husband's wealth, and that gives them a certain level of power. So there was a very unique situation developing in Virginia where you had many of these women with a lot more personal power than they would have had anywhere else in the world at this time in history and they've got a lot of wealth along with it. 
We move on now to talk more about Chief Powhatan, last seen when John Smith was here. Powhatan was the leader of the Powhatan Confederacy. Basically, he dominated a few dozen small tribes in the James River area at the time that the English arrived. So these are tribes under their own individual leaders that have been united into the Powhatan Confederacy, and they answer ultimately to Chief Powhatan. The English encounter these natives, and they didn't understand that these were different tribes. They thought they were all one tribe, so they called all Indians in the area Powhatans. Powhatan himself probably saw the English as allies in his struggle to control other Indian nations in the region. He's very focused on trying to consolidate his own power. The English show up, and based on his behavior toward the English, initially he didn't seem to dislike them. Now, he didn't really like John Smith very much, but John Smith didn't treat him well. In general, Powhatan deals pretty favorably with the English initially. And based on his behavior, it seems like probably he thought these might be a good ally against other Indian nations that don't want to be under my confederacy. So here is the territory that the Powhatan Confederacy stretched. Everything in purple is under him. In the little red symbol are Indian settlements. The dots are the English settlements. So you can see the English are not just coming to this pristine, open, empty land. The land is already full of Native Americans. There's different Native settlements all over the place, and the English are living among them. This is a recreation of a typical Indian dwelling within the Powhatan Confederacy, the type of home that they built. This is at Jamestown, if you ever get the chance to visit uh, Jamestown's awesome to get to visit. Now, probably from looking at that map and seeing that we have native settlements in among English settlements, and if you remember what I told you in the last lesson, that the English have this nasty habit of starting out on good terms with the Native Americans, and then they somehow screw it up, culture clash is going to happen. It's almost inevitable. So relations between the Indians and the settlers worsened over time. In the beginning, there was kind of a general mistrust because of different cultures and languages. The English have this bad habit of interpreting anyone who lives differently from them as being inherently wrong. Uh, I'm sure you probably know some people today who still feel that way. And so there's a, a culture clash that's already happening there. Then it's made worse by the fact the English will raid Indian food supplies anytime they start starving. Now, you can't completely fault a starving person from doing anything possible to stay alive. But at the same time, the English irritate the Indians because the Indians don't understand why these English don't prepare for times of low food. Why don't they farm sufficiently? Why don't they put enough food in their storehouses? And it comes down to a knowledge issue. The English are trying to farm. Many of them have never been farmers. And they're farming in a different climate, different soil. Everything's different from home. And they kind of rather naively thought that farming would be the same anywhere in the world. And, you know, they unfortunately were very wrong. So this is creating increasing conflict. 1610 to 1614 is the first Anglo-Powhatan War. By the name, you can probably infer there was more than one Anglo-Powhatan War. Uh, that word Anglo means English, so it's a war between the Native Americans and the English. 1610's when that war started. Do you remember what year Jamestown was founded? 1607. Oh dear, it only took them three years to get into a war. Jamestown's governor, Baron Delaware, a.k.a. Lord Delaware, hey, we got a state by that name. I wonder if maybe it's named after him, had orders to make war on the Indians. So the English raided villages, burned houses, took supplies, burned cornfields, and the Indians fought back. Four years of fighting. So... After four years of fighting, there was a peace treaty negotiated, and we get eight years of peace. What initiated and helped the peace treaty 
was the marriage of Pocahontas, the daughter of Powhatan, to Englishman John Rolfe. Um, so Pocahontas, it was nothing like the Disney movie. She was not an Indian princess. The Indians didn't have princesses. Very English idea. She was one of P uh, Powhatan's daughters. She'd gotten to know the English because as a little kid, she would come over to Jamestown and play with the boys. And she would also bring food to Jamestown when the people were hungry. So nice little kid, right? She gets to know the English, builds a friendship with them. John Smith wrote about her in some of his writings about her being a cute, mischievous little kid. Um, the Englishman didn't even actually know her real name. Pocahontas is actually her nickname. Um, Pocahontas basically means mischievous child, which tells you a lot about her personality. So in 1613, the English actually kidnapped Pocahontas, despite her being a friend of the English, because they were hoping to pressure Powhatan into peace by having his daughter. And while she was in captivity, she ended up converting to Christianity. At that time, she got to know the wealthy widower, John Rolfe. John Rolfe decided he wanted to marry her. She was willing, so the two got married. And at that point, it made the peace arrangement easier. There's a marriage that unites the natives with the English. Um, if you're curious what Pocahontas looked like, this is an illustration that was done of her. Again, very different from the Disney movie. And so Pocahontas went on to have a son with John Rolfe. Sadly, she died in England just a few years after they were married. Um, probably had pneumonia or something similar. And so John Rolfe buried her in England, and he actually later came back. Their son lived. Their son went on to grow up, get married, have kids. So 1622 to 1644, we break out into periodic attacks between the Indians and the settlers. And it started in 1622 when the Indians attacked the English, killed 347 people, including John Rolfe. Um, there had been some little skirmishes before this, but this was like the big thing that sets off more war. After this attack, the Virginia Company called for perpetual war against the Native Americans. So at that point, it's one thing after another, both sides doing wrong things to each other. The raids reduced the Native population and eventually the Powhatan Confederacy breaks apart and the Indians move further westward to get away from the English. But we're not done. Because in 1644 to 1646 is the second Anglo-Powhatan War. Powhatan gets some allies and he decides, I have got to get rid of these English people once and for all. They can't be trusted. So it is a last effort of the local natives to defeat the English but the Indians are defeated. So at that point, they just give up on living in that area. There's a peace treaty in 1646, which removes the Powhatans from their original land. And it formally separates Indian and English settlement areas, which sets a precedent. From now on, from this point forward, we're not gonna live together, we will live separately. And it also sets this trend that from now on, the story of American history is going to be coming into land that's already occupied, taking that land through treaties, moving the Indians typically further west. Um, sometimes moving them further south for a while. This is a woodcutting that was done depicting one of the battles of the Second Powhatan War. So what made the Chesapeake area prosperous at last? By Chesapeake area, we're talking modern day Virginia, even modern day Maryland. One very important cash crop, ta-da! That, my friends, is tobacco. It is tobacco that, in a sense, saves Jamestown and Virginia by providing a valuable cash crop. 1618, Virginia was already producing 20,000 pounds a year of tobacco. And that tobacco is incredibly valuable over in Europe because tobacco is all the rage now. Everybody's loving this. All the wealthy people use it, men and women. 
Four years later, despite losing nearly one third of its colonists in an Indian attack, which would be the Powhatan Confederacy, Virginia still manages to produce 60,000 pounds of tobacco. So they have, in four years, tripled their output despite losing a third of their colonists. Five years later, they're producing 500,000 pounds of tobacco in a year. Two years after that, 1,500,000 pounds. Now think back to those statistics that we looked at that we were drawing some inferences of. Do you remember seeing that the African slave population was growing dramatically in Virginia over time? Well, here's why. Tobacco. Tobacco has a huge impact on Virginia. It puts Virginia on firm economic footing, finally, because the colonies here just weren't really making money beforehand. But tobacco is ruinous to the soil when you continuously plant it, and the English didn't understand that. So what would happen is they would grow tobacco over and over and over again because it is the single cash crop that they care about in this area. And unfortunately, they're killing their soil. So the tobacco will produce really well for a while and then it's going to get less successful, less successful. They basically will kill off the land and then they have to move to start farming new land, which is going to be a constant reason for people to move further westward. Tobacco chained Virginia's economy to this single crop. So that's going to be a problem because what happens if something happens to that crop? You really need to diversify if you want a healthy economy. And because of tobacco, that further promotes that plantation system of settlement being a matter of large scale plantations rather than lots of villages. So when people come to Virginia, they're looking to get themselves a very large amount of land. They're going to live pretty independently and they're going to grow tobacco. The other issue with tobacco is it creates the need for cheap, abundant labor, which means indentured servants. Indentured servants were people that would come over and they're basically going to be the equivalent of a slave, but for a set amount of time. They sign a contract. And at the end of the contract, they're supposed to get paid and be allowed to leave. It didn't always work that way. There was a lot of abuse. But slavery becomes more and more common. And as you may remember from those statistics, by 1690, the number of slaves to white indentured servants is more than four times as many. Um, so let's talk for a second about indentured servitude because indentured servitude was popular for a while. And then eventually it got replaced by slavery. Initially, Virginia used a system called the headright system as a way of growing Virginia. A headright was a legal grant of land given to settlers, but there was a condition. So in order to get this headright or this land grant, basically free land, you had to pay for the transportation costs of laborers because initially the people that were coming over to Virginia were wealthy people who didn't want to work. We need to get laborers who are actually accustomed to work and who are willing to work. So if you pay for the transportation costs of laborers, you get 50 acres per laborer that you bring over. Well, that's a pretty big incentive to bring more people over, right? Until 1699, slaves also counted. So you could bring ordinary laborers who are going to live independently. You could pay for the transportation of white servants or including indentured servants. And you could pay for slaves to come. Any of that counted, you got 50 acres per. So by giving land to landowning masters, indentured servants had very little chance of procuring their own land. And of course, slaves had no chance. So the result of this system was that it kept many of the colonials in Virginia poor, and it created this very strict class division of poor servants with wealth, wealthy landowners. They're 
basically kind of recreating the same problems that England had with this very, very firm class structure. One of the problems with indentured servitude is that it, it involved children. So in Britain and in Ireland, it became quite common to kidnap orphans and poor children as young as the age of five and sell them into effectively white slavery in the American colonies. So some indentured servants came over on contracts. These children didn't even have contracts. They didn't sign anything. Their parents didn't sign anything. They got plucked off the street and sent to the Americas and their parents didn't even know what happened to them. That tells you a lot about the status of the poor in Britain and Ireland. So by the 1700s then, many German immigrants started selling their children into service in order to pay for the parents' voyage to America. So what these German parents would do is sell a child between the ages of 5 and 15 into service with an actual contract, and they would be in service until the age of 21. Very common. And then you'd use the money from selling your child to pay for your own voyage and be reunited with your child after they reach the age of 21 and were free from their contract. And it sounds horrible to us today, but back then this was not nearly as horrible as it sounds today. It actually was sometimes a very good opportunity for these families to come over here and be able to get their own land, be able to build their own wealth. Indentured servitude wasn't necessarily pleasant, but again, it was common. So all the colonies used indentured servitude, not just Virginia. And again, it typically was children. There were also apprenticeships which worked similarly. You'd be under a contract. The most common age was between the ages of 9 and 12, and it was both boys and girls. You would work for this one family, you would gain skills, and then, you know, eventually you're off on your own. So this is an example of an indenture contract. Typically, a contract is for five to seven years. Now, it can be longer if the child is younger. But usually you're signing a five-year contract. You're promised freedom dues, which would be land and money at the end of your contract. A lot of times they didn't actually get land, though. And sometimes the money was not enough to really be a free person after this. So you just go from one servitude to another. Under an indenture contract, you were forbidden to marry. And remember that it's a really rough time. There's a lot of diseases and hunger and hardship. So very early on, 1610 to 1614, only one out of every 10 people outlived their indenture contracts. Most 90% of indentured servants actually died as effectively kind of a white slave. So we get to some problems in Virginia. The freemen, people who are, are not in slavery, become very frustrated. By the late 1600s, there was a social problem of large numbers of young, poor, discontented men in the Chesapeake area because this class structure is a problem. The poor have little access to land. There's also another issue. There is a huge shortage of women. See, because under that headright system, it really made more sense to bring male laborers over, and those were the people that would want to come. And indentured servants can't marry, so there are women, but they're young and they're indentured servants. So many poor men are never going to be able to marry. There, there's no one. That's very frustrating. Then it gets even worse because in 1670, the Virginia Assembly, in other words, the government, disenfranchised most of the landless men by passing a policy that no land equals no vote. You only have the right to vote if you're a landowner. Now, part of their thinking is this would mean that people would be more invested in making the right decisions for our colony if they actually own land. But part of it, too, is they didn't want the poor people voting because the idea at the time was if you're poor, then, you know, there's probably a reason you're poor. God probably made you poor because you're a bad person or, you know, your, your family must have committed some really big sins and or maybe you're just stupid and that's why you're poor. 
So no land equals no vote. You have little access to the land. You can't get married. You can't vote to make things better. And most people view landless individuals as being inferior in some way. You can see how there'd be a lot of frustration building. Well, here comes the man to make it all worse. Governor William Berkeley, this dandy fellow. He is the colonial governor of Virginia, and he's one of the Lord's proprietors of the colony of Carolina, a new colony that we'll talk about later. So one of the things that Governor Berkeley does is he enacts some friendly policies toward the Native Americans in order to monopolize on the local fur trade. He's very driven by wealth in his decision making. And in general, both then and now, he's considered a rather corrupt, ineffective governor. Very financially motivated, very self-motivated, and he really doesn't do much to protect his own citizens. Because he wants this fur trade with the Native Americans, he refuses to retaliate whenever the Indians attack frontier settlements. So the colonists feel that their own governor is not protecting them the way that he should. And they're also a bit frustrated with how wealthy he's growing while there's this whole class of young men that are not growing wealthy. Enter Nathaniel Bacon. Nathaniel Bacon is a colonist and a member of the governor's consul in Jamestown. He's also actually related to Berkeley by marriage. He becomes frustrated by these repeated Indian raids on settlements and Berkeley's lack of action. He is so irritated with this governor. And there's a lot of angry men all around him, so he joins them together. He musters a force of between four and 500 men, and they rebel. They make a list of eight grievances, and they oppose the colonial government. So Bacon's Rebellion, 1676. Mind you, we are not even one century into this colony and we're already having a massive rebellion. Bacon eventually has 1,000 Virginians behind him and they march against the governor. The main issue being the lack of consideration, both perceived and actual for the colonists' safety, especially along the western border areas. But there's also a lot of other issues. They've got their, again, list of eight grievances. The rebels come from all classes and races. This is important because this is not an all-white militia. They had Africans who had joined them. And it's not just those disenfranchised poor men. There's wealthy people that have joined too because Berkeley has managed to tick off many people from every group within society. Well done, Berkeley. So a united army of all social classes, all races within this colony. That's going to be significant, so remember that fact. This is the first rebellion in the American colonies in which discontented frontiersmen take place. Previously, any fighting has been against foreign enemies like the Spanish or it's been against Native Americans. This is the first time the colonists have actually turned inward against themselves. If you look on this map here, you can see the settled area is in purple. This is all the lands that the English have settled on at this point. You can also see where their settlements are. The red lines show where Bacon's campaign takes place. So he's off on the frontier. Let's look at what he does. Unfortunately, Bacon's group attacked the Indians first, including many who were actually friendly to the whites. Because remember, one of the major causes behind this rebellion is they feel that they're not being protected from the Indians. Indians are attacking their citizens periodically, but there's also Indians who are allies. Bacon's rebellion makes no distinction between enemy and ally. They just attack Indians. They also drive the governor from Jamestown not put him in a car and drive him away. They chase him out violently. So Governor Berkeley is out of there. The rebels burn the capital and they go on a rampage of plundering. 
And it's, it's basically like an out of control riot at this point. Then Bacon dies suddenly of dysentery, which you get from drinking polluted water. Uh, it's a very unpleasant way to die. You basically have diarrhea until you drain your body of resources. There's a little fun medical fact for you. So the rebels are without leadership. So far, they've been pretty successful in this rebellion. But once they don't have a leader, it's chaos. At this point, Berkeley comes back. He gets some soldiers. He brutally crushes the remaining rebellion and publicly hangs 20 of the rebels. Here we have an artist's depiction of the burning of Jamestown, part of Bacon's rebellion. So let's look at the aftermath. Why is this one event so important to American history? Because believe me, it is important. This event has huge, huge consequences, most of them unintended consequences. One issue is it exposed the resentments that were existing within society as society was developing. You had frontiersmen and landless former servants versus the landowning upper class. You could also kind of summarize that as rural versus urban. So this socioeconomic class difference and the resulting clashes between the rural and the urban communities, they start with Bacon's Rebellion, but they're going to be a continuous part of American history, and they continue even to this day. We still have never resolved this issue of rural versus urban. Another problem, the upper class planters wanted laborers that are going to be less likely to rebel because a lot of indentured servants were among those who rebelled since their contracts were pretty unfair. They knew they weren't going to have the future they were supposed to have. So the upper class planters had used slave labor before, but they had also used a lot of indentured servant labor. Now they're going to turn their attention more to black slaves. Slaves have far less power than an indentured servant because even though an indentured servant gets treated like a slave, they get to go free at a certain point under their contract. And they're supposed to get paid and or possibly get some land when they go free. So they decide to focus on black slaves. Black slaves are less likely to rebel in the future than white indentured servants. That leads to a huge growth of slavery and less indentured servitude. So if you think back to those statistics we looked at, we noticed that black slaves vastly outnumber indentured servants over a very short period of time. And this is why. The ruling class feared any further alliance between the indentured servants and the slaves because Remember, Bacon's Rebellion was a united army of all social classes and all races. And in Virginia, slaves and indentured servants outnumber the wealthy. This is true really in most societies. The poor often outnumber the wealthy. So there's a very real fear that another rebellion could happen if the servants and the slaves ever again ally with each other. And so what they did was they deliberately hardened the racial caste of slavery in order to divide the races. Previously, slavery wasn't just Africans. You could have enslaved Native Americans, you had white slavery. Because of Bacon's Rebellion, slavery becomes focused on Africans. And it becomes one of the biggest unintended sources of American racism. There is actually a conscientious effort to teach people that black people are inferior and white people are superior. They tell the indentured servants that, yeah, you're poor, but at least you're not black. And it becomes a huge source of American racism. It's going to be a problem for years afterwards, centuries. We now turn our attention to Maryland. So, Virginia is one of the tobacco colonies. The other tobacco colony is Maryland, seen here in this very lovely picture. Here is an artist's depiction of early Maryland. You can see kind of how they're settling, and you see it 
looks fairly similar to how Virginia was getting settled. But Maryland is unique. So Maryland started with a royal charter that was granted to George Calvert, Lord Baltimore in 1632. So he has his charter, he can establish a colony and Maryland is then established two years later in 1634. Maryland is what's known as a proprietary colony. Well, there's a fun little vocab term. So proprietary colonies are rewards given to allies of kings. Someone who's friends with the king gets a colonial charter that will allow private investment and colonial self-government. And the charters make each proprietor the effective ruler of their colony. So Lord Baltimore, being a friend of the king, is given this land grant that also grants him the right to self-rule this colony that he's going to build. Now, Maryland had an advantage. Their first colony was in a much healthier location than Jamestown. So while they have a rough start, it's not anywhere near the nightmare that Jamestown was. And people have learned since Jamestown. Maybe not learned enough, but they've learned. Tobacco is going to be the main cash crop because it's been doing so well in Virginia. Baltimore's plan was to govern as an absentee proprietor in a feudal relationship. So basically, he's going to give large land grants to wealthy landowners, and they will kind of be responsible for maintaining society under them, just like in feudal Europe. He, meanwhile, isn't really going to be a hands-on governor. So he gives huge tracts of land to all his Catholic relatives. It's important that they're Catholic. So a little bit about George Calvert, a.k.a. Lord Baltimore. He was a British member of Parliament, and he was also their Secretary of State under King James I. But he lost political power after a royal marriage debacle. They were trying to marry the king off to a strategic alliance and it didn't work. And so Lord Calvert, sorry, Lord Baltimore suffers the consequence of losing all political power. He then converts to Catholicism and Britain at this time is Protestant. So he gets persecuted for his faith. Not a good time to be Catholic in England. So Lord Baltimore has this idea that he's going to found a haven for Catholics in the New World, which will also be a source of wealth. That's why those landowning relatives are going to get these large tracts of land. And anyone who's Catholic can come over here. They can be wealthy landowners. Catholics will be protected. And although Baltimore has lost his political power, he still has a good enough friendship with the king that he can get this charter. Unfortunately for him, he dies before he can realize his vision. Five weeks before the sealing of the charter, he dies. So his son takes over and does basically what his father had envisioned. But the settlement of Maryland takes an unexpected path. So you're going to have the large tracts of land given to the wealthy Catholics, but you also need some workers. You need ordinary people to come over as colonists. And they run into a little sticking point. Colonists are only willing to come to Maryland if they receive land, because they've seen what happened in Virginia and what's continuing to happen in Virginia. So they have to give land grants to anyone that's going to come into this colony. What they give are small land grants, so the people who come over have modest farms that are dispersed around the Chesapeake area, Chesapeake Bay. So all of these little farms are Protestants. The Catholic land barons, who are Baltimore's relatives, have their large tracts of land, and then they are completely surrounded by mostly Protestant small farmers that seems like that might cause a bit of a problem. And it does. Conflict between the barons and the farmers eventually leads to unrest within Maryland. And as a result of that, the Baltimore family loses the proprietary rights at the end of the 17th century. In other words, at the end of the 1600s. Also, in the late 1600s, 
people began importing African slaves to the colony. So slavery came to Maryland a little bit later than it did Virginia. So by 1673, you can see what settlement looks like in the United States. We've got everything in red is settled by mostly English. And then the yellow is still largely unclaimed by the English. But remember, you have a lot of Native Americans living on that land. It's not empty land. Well, Maryland is supposed to be a haven for Catholics, right? So Lord Baltimore, the son of the founder, permitted a high degree of freedom of worship in order to prevent a repeat of persecution of Catholics by Protestants. See, he wants Catholics protected, but he knows that if you abuse the Protestants, they're going to rise up against you. So he decides Maryland is going to be religiously tolerant to everyone. The high number of Protestants in the area felt very threatened because of the overwhelming rights that had initially been given to the Catholics. So he's got a, a little issue he needs to deal with before it explodes. Uh, unfortunately, as we saw, he wasn't entirely successful. But in an effort to protect people, they passed the Maryland Toleration Act of 1649, strongly supported by the Catholics. This act grants toleration to all Christians. Now, did you notice any people who are missing in that sentence? Hopefully you inferred who this act does not protect. The act protects toleration for Christians and nobody else. It's the first law on religious tolerance in British North America. It influences related laws in the other colonies. And eventually, this is the basis for the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Thankfully, we did not just copy it verbatim. There's a lot of edits made before this becomes the First Amendment later. Uh, and you'll see why in just a second. One of many issues with the Maryland Toleration Act of 1649 is it decreed death to those who denied the divinity of Jesus. So Jews, atheists, etc., non-Christians, if you deny the divinity of Jesus Christ, you can be executed in Maryland. Well, that's not exactly religiously tolerant, is it? No, in actuality, the Toleration Act actually made Maryland less tolerant because the way it was written, it allowed the religious people to persecute the non-religious Instead of giving equal protection to everyone, it favored one group, and of course that leads to persecution of other groups. Um, this is actual text from the Mar Maryland Toleration Act of 1649. This is just one paragraph. I wanted to allow you to really appreciate the richness of the colonial writing, and the spelling is copied from the original document. Um, this is one of the absolute granddaddies of run-on sentences. Whatsoever person or persons shall from henceforth, upon any occasion of offense, otherwise in a reproachful manner or way, declare, call, or denominate any person or persons whatsoever inhabiting, residing, trafficking, trading, or commercing within this province, or within any ports, harbors, creeks, or havens to the same belonging, an heretic, schismatic, idolater, puritan, independent separatist, popish priest, Jesuit, Jesuited papist, Lutheran, Calvinist, Anabaptist, Brownist, or any other name or term in a reproachful manner relating to matters of religion shall for every such offense forfeit and lose the sum of ten shillings sterling or the value thereof to be levied on the goods and chattels of every such offender and offenders. Now, I'm pretty sure you probably didn't understand that massive run-on sentence, which is still not finished. Note from the little dot, dot, dots. <laughs> that's, that's all one sentence. Um, keep in mind when you're working on your essay for the GED language arts section, this is why run-on sentences are bad. You get really, really lost in the words. What this is attempting to establish is a fine if you speak in a derogatory manner regarding religion to anyone. And they give specific examples of different religious groups, which I, I love. Um, in a nutshell, there's a fine if you speak badly to someone who's, re who's religious on the issue of religion. And if you can't pay the fine, you're going to be publicly whipped and imprisoned without bail. Again, I kept the original spelling. 
until he, she, or they shall satisfy the party so offended and grieved by such reproachful language. So basically, if you insult someone's religion, you will be fined. And if you can't pay the fine, they can just keep whipping and imprisoning you until you are able to pay the fine or otherwise satisfy the person you offended. And so I hope from this you've realized the Maryland Toleration Act of 1649 is not, in fact, tolerant. And there we will leave off. We leave behind our tobacco colonies of Virginia and Maryland. We will pick up with them later. And in the next presentation, we're going to travel up to New England. <laughs>